Okay, people, uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, with our grand rounds uh, for today. Um, while the uh, rest of everybody else is braving the traffic uh, to get here. Um, so I have uh, no specific announcements uh, for this morning. Um, I see that uh, I forgot to remind Jason to give me the list of people, you know, who had had the best attendance in October. But remember, you know, that uh, beginning last month, you know, we were going to have one grand prize, you know, within the gift cards to Panera Bread that was going to be somewhat higher, you know, than the other gift cards. Um, at any rate, uh, today we have the usual uh, exciting dermatology grand rounds. Everybody waits to see the ghastly pictures, um, you know, that uh, tend to entertain us as much as they horrify us. And to uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, I'm going to ask the uh, chief of the section of dermatology, Jeff Callen, to come to the podium. Okay, thanks, Eleanor. I'll be brief so that our uh, visitor has a full time to uh, to, to expound uh, and to show us those pictures that uh, that we find beautiful and <laughs> Eleanor finds you know disgusting. Um, our, our visitor today is Arash uh, Mastajimi, and uh, he is uh, assistant, as you see, is an assistant professor of medicine and uh, dermatology at uh, Harvard. Uh, he's at the Brigham specifically. Uh, he's originally from uh, Blacksburg, uh, Virginia. He grew up uh, around uh, around Virginia Tech. Uh, his dad's an uh, assistant dean there, uh, not in medicine, in uh, I think he said agriculture. Is that right? Yeah, so the ag school. Um, and uh, then he uh, went to undergrad at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, eventually uh, made it up to Boston, went up the East Coast and did his uh, medical school internal medicine training and, uh, and dermatology training there, and then he stayed on the staff there. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, assistant editors of uh, the JAMA Dermatology, um, and uh, he is uh, very interested in the interface between uh, medicine and uh, dermatology, as you'll uh, see this morning. Uh, Rosh, let me have you come up and take over. Welcome. All right, guys, thank you for coming. And so, perfect. Jason, is this on? Yep. It's on perfect. Uh, thank you very much for coming, guys. Uh, I appreciate, you know, usually when you, when you go from one place to another to give a grand round, there's an adjustment when you go. I was uh, surprised you guys still in the Eastern time zone, which was, uh, it was great for me, and also that the weather was exactly the same as what I left in Boston, so I appreciate that. Uh, on, on, on both accounts. Uh, today we're going to talk about an old friend, cellulitis, and I, I think that the, uh, we'll, there's a lot that we can do uh, as a partnership between medicine and dermatology to think about the disease and to improve the care that we provide. I must apologize in advance. My, my pictures aren't that ghastly, so I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but I will be happy to send you guys ghastly pictures afterwards if, you're, if, you, if you wish. I have two daughters. My older daughter has alopecia universalis, so I do a lot of research in alopecia, and those are my, where my um, conflicts of interest lie. Nothing that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I, I have no association with anything we're going to be talking about today. All right, so let's take a step back. So when I was in college, maybe early medical school, and I had this, you know, we all have this impression, what is medicine? What matters in medicine? What kind of doctor do you want to be? This is what I thought about. I thought about incredible differential diagnoses, right? Making, solving the case, cracking the case that, that nobody would know. Profound surgical techniques, right? You can see where I was getting my inspiration from. This is what I should have been studying. The idea that you'd be cool and calm under pressure, right? In times of intensity that the physician would, would help guide the team and, and lead things. And in fact, you know, the more I get into medicine, it's incredible because what, what really matters, what really makes a difference are incredibly simple, dull, and boring things, right? Head of bed above a certain, a certain number of degrees to reduce you know, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Washing your hands. This is the most simple intervention that's been shown over and over to make an improvement is like what we struggle with the most, right? And <laughs> fully, right? When to put them in, when to take them out, not leaving them, not leaving them in, reducing antibiotics, uh, from uh, unnecessary infections that come from lines, catheters, et cetera. None of these things are sexy, right? None of them are actually incredibly compelling, 
they're actually all very rote, which is why, you know, I don't know about your institution, but my institution, it's been like the 20th year where we try to improve our hand washing, improve our hand washing, and then the moment you improve it, it's hard to keep it, right? It starts, it starts eroding over time. But these are the things when we think about public health, right? In the same way that like a new medication is much less important than let's say water quality being good, right? Or, or safe access to water and hygiene. These really rote things are the things that make a big difference. I think cellulitis is one of these rote things that is boring. It is tremendously unsexy. That's, even for dermatologists, it's not very many fancy pictures that I was saying. It's not a very compelling thing, but it's really important. And I think most of us, being both in the medicine side and on the dermatology side, we see a lot of patients with cellulitis, we feel pretty comfortable with it, and we don't really think about it. There's just kind of a churn that, 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 that goes on. Who here is taking care of a patient with cellulitis in the last month? All right, so it's pretty common across a bunch of different specialties. And as we'll find, we're even off season, right? The, the, the summer is really the, the, the key time for this. So slowly, you know, everybody has one patient on their census, say maybe one or two every, every, every week or so. 14.5 million outpatient visits annually, almost 3 million ED visits annually, 4 billion in ED costs, 10 million in inpatient costs, and then there's this constant churn of, of readmissions, and we each have seen care of the patient that has come back over and over with cellulitis, who was thought to be cellulitis. Now, the thing is that even though it's common, and even though we see it, it being common and it being easy to diagnose and easy to manage are two different things. So this is a picture from a review article in JAMA from a couple of years ago. They're from uh, Dr. Daniela Krasinski, my colleague at MGH. Uh, and these are all patients who she thought were consulted for uh, um, cellulitis. So they're people who had been thought to have cellulitis, were treated for cellulitis, um, and weren't getting better. So she, as, a, as an inpatient dermatologist, uh, was consulted on these patients. So you can easily see, right, these are all, what do we talk about when you're talking to medical students? It's red, right, it's hot, it hurts. It's on an extremity. But these are all very reasonable things. The things that we talk about there are the signs and symptoms of cellulitis, right? Maybe some of these patients fell sick, maybe they didn't. But when we look at it, I don't think it's unreasonable to consider cellulitis in a differential for any of these things, or all of them. But this patient here has acute stasis after having a DVT. This one here has calciphylaxis. It's a little bit harder for you guys to see. There's a little bit of a vascular pattern here. Uh, so calciphylaxis is when you get deposition of, of, a, of calcium and phosphate that causes a, a, that destroys blood vessels in the skin. This is straight stasis dermatitis in a patient with uh, congestive heart failure. You can see that it's probably the first time they've had it or among the first times they've had it because they don't have very much stigmata of chronic stasis on their leg. This patient had a hematoma. So although this leg was red and hot, it's in the context of trauma. Here's an erythema migraine from Lyme. Do you guys have much Lyme here in this area? With global warming, you will. It will come. The, uh, and uh, so Lyme disease, uh, uh, this diagnosis. And then finally, this person has cellulitis. But honestly, I think if you flip these pictures around, it would be very difficult to, to say which one is which. And I, I'm cheating. I have my, uh, my, my guide here. So I spend about half my time uh, seeing patients in the inpatient setting. So not very, most dermatology is outpatient. There are a few of us that really specialize in taking care of inpatients. And what I was identifying is I was getting a lot of calls for patients who had cellulitis but weren't getting better, were being treated for cellulitis but weren't getting better. And usually these are patients that were taking care of hospital day three, four, or five, right? And often we would see them and we'd say, oh, this is not only, either they needed to change their evaluation and treatment to something completely different, right? So we're ordering new tests, new evaluations, et cetera, because they're, they were um, misinterpreting the, the physical findings. Or sometimes they had very limited or benign conditions that they didn't even need to be in the hospital. So the questions we were asked a couple years ago is how often is this happening? What's the associated cost? I'm going to use the word cost. I'm going to talk about money because I think money is important. I think finances are important, particularly in this day and age in medicine. But I really mean cost in terms of also human burden. Like what is the, what is the disadvantage to people who are patients who are, who are suffering with this? And secondly, the bigger question, well, how can we fix this problem? So how can we make it that instead of treating somebody and on day five or six figuring out that they're not responding in the way that we want and changing it, what are some tools that we could use earlier? So in 2016, we, we, we did an analysis of, of cases at our institution and, and, and combined that with data from many different institutions and modeled out the, the cost uh, associated with misdiagnosis of lower extremity cellulitis. So we identified that about a third of patients with lower extremity cellulitis were misdiagnosed. So if you ask, for those of you who are research oriented, you'll say, well, how did you know, right? So the way that we knew in this case was first either that their diagnosis had been changed during the time they were in the hospital or then during the 30 days afterwards. So looking at, at 
uh, changes in behavior or practice reconsideration of the diagnosis. And then looking back, about 85% of these patients, had they had the right diagnosis, may have never needed hospitalization. And about 90% of them received antibiotics that they wouldn't have received in another setting. So some of these people had like pneumonia and all needed antibiotics anyway, right? And were thought to be treated for both pneumonia and cellulitis. But for the majority of them, they're getting a lot of exposures they didn't need. And this would lead nationally to, this is their very conservative estimates, around $300, $400 million in uh, avoidable healthcare spending. So what I want to talk about is not just the money, but actually the, the health cost of patients. So we know, and those of us who take care of patients, we know that you know, this is one of these classic um, iatrogenesis fulminans cases, right? Somebody shows up with a problem, you give them the wrong treatment, then you end up treating the four other problems that you created by giving them the wrong treatment. So that's what we're talking about here. So we're talking about rates of C. diff annually. There's many thousands of people in the U.S. that get C. diff from treatment of cellulitis. This is just lower extremity, not cellulitis, they were just on the legs that they didn't need. Occasional case of anaphylaxis. And then being hospitalized when you don't need to has a lot of consequences in and of itself. So, so many people with nosocomial infections that we could avoid. So our discussion today is going to be rooted in sort of those findings and those, that identification. We're going to ask the question, why is cellulitis difficult to diagnose? We're going to look at some techniques to improve our diagnostic abilities, and we're going to take a sneak peek into the future. What are some things coming down the pipe? So the basics, just to make sure we're on the, on the same page. So cellulitis is referred to, so when you just use the word cellulitis, you're really referring to a bacterial infection of the skin. What you're particularly talking about is an infection of the dermis. We're going to go into that a little bit deeper, and I think that's really critical for understanding this disease. So it's a bacterial infection. Sometimes people will call um, other organisms, like you could, in, in, in dermatology, we say you have an eosinophilic cellulitis, which is more an inflammatory condition, or you could have a non-bacterial, like cryptococcal cellulitis could happen as well. There is definitely a seasonal pattern that's more common in the, in the summer months, and most of us can think about these risk factors. So basically, if you have a crack in the skin, a break in the skin, right, the, what the skin does, it keeps everything in your body in that's supposed to be there and keeps everything that's not supposed to be there out, right? So if you break that, that, that barrier, you can get small amounts of, uh, of, of bacteria, things like that, to cause infection. Uh, obesity, for reasons that are not completely understood, my guess is that some of these patients probably have other conditions that are misdiagnosis of, of cellulitis. Broadly, immunosuppression. So immunosuppression, not just you know, uh, my renal transplant patient, my, my bone marrow transplant patient, but also relative states of immunity, like uh, immune compromise, like diabetes. Lymphatic compromise is a really big one. So you know, there's constantly probably little breaches of our skin with, with uh, bacteria that our lymph system and the body is able to, 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 to clean up. Um, patients that have uh, lymphedema or lymphatic compromise aren't as good at doing that or are more likely to get, to get infection. And then, although we're going to spend most of our time talking about non-purulent cellulitis, um, exposure to other than purulent infection is, is definitely a, um, a risk factor. Um, my favorite paper on this was this classic uh, New England Journal paper on uh, uh, MRSA infections among uh, football players, uh, NFL players. Um, and my favorite image, maybe in the New England Journal ever, was like they had this hot tub where all the they like all hung out in the hot tub together, and uh, that has stuck with me over the years. So common pathogens, it's not that hard. It's basically things that live in the skin and things that are pretty common or what, what what causes. So for your normal host, if it's purulent, you're most likely going to have MRSA. If it's non-purulent, you're most likely going to have strep, but also could be uh, other uh, staph as well. For mild immunosuppression, right, you have you have MRSA uh, and the same, the same thing. What you do is you add a little bit of gram-negative rod. So this, I think, often uh, throws people for a loop. The clinical situation in which I've seen gram-negative rod in these patients is uh, in patients that have a, like a, a UTI or, or, or urinary, um, either colonization or infection with the gram-negative rod. And they sometimes will have a Foley or other sort of uh, instrumentation in this area, and they can get cracks in the skin. So I've seen cellulitis in the groin or in, that, in the upper thighs with gram-negative organisms. You can also get this um, if you have a hematologic spread where you, uh, where you have a systemic uh, gram-negative uh, infection and then you get uh, cellulitis on the skin. And then finally, if you're severely immunosuppressed, basically the, there's no limit, right? Whatever you can think of, you can find in these patients. And uh, both they have, remember that you can still have normal infections even though you're immunocompromised, right? But the, the uh, long tail of the differential gets extremely broad. And this is just to, uh, I, I, the goal of this talk is not to go through the treatment of cellulitis. I think there's great uh, uh, IDSA and institutional guidelines for that. Um, there's a lot of things, of course, if you have exposure to animals, if you're you know, swimming in fresh water, like there's lots of different things that you can get. But this should cover the basics. Antibiotic recommendations really reflect this, this uh, infection pattern. So basically for 
the uh, MFSA or streptococcal, the non-purulent, you basically do a cephalosporin, um, either oral or, or IV, uh, with some adjustments uh, or beta lactam, if, if you uh, with some adjustments if you um, have an allergy. Uh, for MRSA, this is basically your list of uh, things that treat MRSA. What I would do for patients that have a purulent cellulitis is first to make sure there's no abscess to drain, and I think maybe now the rate of ultrasound has extended a lot more in these patients to identify that and to drain that. Um, but secondly, I would use what, whatever your local characteristics are, your local antibiotic nomogram uh, for the relative benefit of, you know, a tetracycline versus Bactrim versus uh, clindamycin, et cetera. Obviously, yeah, we have a lot of uh, options for the IV. But let's get back to the, the main question we were trying to ask. And this question is, why, why is cellulitis hard to diagnose? So this is a picture of my favorite organ, the skin. So we have here the epidermis, the very top of the skin, and then we have the dermis here. So the dermis is the layer right, right, right below. And then you get uh, deeper into the fascia and to the muscle. And what we're talking about here, cellulitis is really this infection of the dermis. Okay, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more precisely in a moment. Other things that are like cousins of cellulitis are, so, so here's the cellulitis and the dermis. Other things that are cousins of cellulitis are erysipelas. Erysipelas is a bacterial infection, but it's at the lymphatic channels right at the edge in the border here, okay? So it's a little more, has a little more predilection to the face, but can be, can be in other places. Patients with erysipelas have a really striking presentation. They have high, high, high spiking fevers. They have a very clearly demarcated. So when you're in the dermis, well, for reason we'll talk about in a moment, it's a little bit diffuse, kind of, and you can see all of those you've tried to outline, to draw on a cellulitis patient, or you've gotten a patient from the ED and you're like, how do they decide where to draw these lines, right? It's because it can be a little bit hard. It can be a little bit hard to see. And erysipelas, though, because it's so superficial, it's very easy to see, and you can see in this patient a very striking line. It's not hard to say where there's no disease and where there is disease. Also with erysipelas, you can, they need IV antibiotics. They usually need it for longer, because it's hard to get the antibiotics into this, these areas because the lymph, area, the lymph is obstructed. And secondly, in patients who are treated with this, uh, for this condition, they can actually have long-term sequelae where they get um, like a local stasis dermatitis or local lymphedema because those lymphatic channels are involved. So think about that as more superficial involving lymph. We're always worried about these deeper infections, necrotizing fasciitis, et cetera, that are, that are down here. And then here's my beautiful graphic uh, of a uh, abscess, right? And abscess, these are walled off. It can be really in any layer, but they're usually a little bit deeper. And that's why when you look at an abscess like this, usually the skin up top looks normal, right? So the epidermis is usually normal, and mostly usually the dermis is normal as well, and then it's, it's extending into the deeper areas. So connecting the level of the skin and the pathophysiology of this disease to the clinical appearance really allows us to understand why it's difficult to uh, diagnose. So where things are in your skin determ the, the, determines how they look. So all of you probably have um, sort of uh, probably repressed memories at this point of some dermatologist asking you something a macule or papule or this and that, and you're as a medical student sweating while you're looking at this thing, and the only word that comes to mind is red. Maybe the second word that comes to mind is maculopapular. The reason for these things are, the reason that these matter, the reason that we're, we're interested in those words is that for us as dermatologists, the words you use help us uh, create differentials, and those differentials are based on where things are in the skin. So this is a picture of psoriasis here, and psoriasis is a disease of epidermal hyperproliferation. So you can think of, of uh, this as being more, more superficial, right, than, than erysipelas. It's more superficial and scaly because it's really here just in the top, not even in this layer, but just in the, in the not even the border, but just at the top. But very similar to this condition, right, you can see that where you have psoriasis and where you don't is really easy because you're looking right at it. The pathology is right at the top layer of the skin. There's nothing really concealing it, okay? So epidermal diseases are, are pretty easy to spot. Now the hard part with the dermis is that you're playing the classic game, and the game is, you know, it's the shell game. So what's under my hand? What am I holding in my hand? Well, you know I'm holding something in my hand. Am I holding a pen? Am I holding the clicker? Am I holding whatever? I'm here giving a talk. You can guess that I'm holding this clicker. I wish I was a magician. I would like pull out like a, a, bit, a rabbit. That's in my next talk. But, um, but so you can use clues, right? You can use clues and stuff, but you can't see what I'm holding in my hand. You don't really know, you're guessing, right? Based on the clinical situation that you're seeing. So every time you're looking at anything in the dermis, that's what you're seeing. So if you have a bug bite and it causes inflammation in the dermis, it can look very similar to uh, you know, a, a, a trauma or any of the other differential things that we talked about. So if you go back to all these things, all these are situations in which the end, end point, the common end point is that you have inflammation in the dermis, okay? Inflammation in dermis is, that's just what's there. 
And now when we're saying cellulitis, we give that diagnosis, we're saying this inflammation in the dermis is from bacterial infection of the dermis. But in our mind, we have to think, is it from trauma? Is it from a reaction to extravasated red blood cells? Is it because I have a vasculitis? Is it because I have an eosinophilic infiltration that has come because of a drug allergy or a, or, a, um, or, or a bite that I had gotten? Things along those lines. You can imagine when people say I got a bite, and then they say that my bug bite got infected, why that's so hard, right? Because it's red, it's hot, it may be expanding, it's hard to identify when is it allergic, when is it not. But it's really because of the, of the level of skin that it's in. So that's why it's hard. Why, how can we do better? What are, what are our options for, for doing better? So this is a medicine talk, so I figured we'd go back to basics. They say all, all the medicine diagnosis should be made uh, with a history, right? So we think about the context and history and diagnosis. And what I really want you to fo focus on is on this column over here. This is basically, we are looking at the association of past medical history is whether or not you had pseudocellulitis, so these mimickers, or whether we had, we had cellulitis. So it's that acute kidney injury, cirrhosis, diabetes, HIV status, transplant status, all these different things, whether you had all these other sort of skin conditions or prior histories, whether you had malignancy. And we did this as part of a study I'm going to talk about in the next slide. What was amazing to me is that if I showed you this paper, this, this table one, and I told you that we had randomized people to these groups, you'd say, oh, that's a perfect randomization. All the p-values are not even remotely then Look at this, 7.6 versus 8.9, you know, 31.6 versus 31.7. 12.7 versus 13.3. So I think it's correct to say that if I have a history of diabetes or I have a history of some of these conditions, then my risk of, for cellulitis goes up, okay? That's a, that is a correct statement. You're at higher risk for cellulitis. It seems that these are also things that make you higher risk for mimickers of cellulitis. So while your overall threshold, the overall sense that this person may have a higher risk of getting infected is correct, it's not an appropriate differential between it and mimickers of, of, of cellulitis. And I think this is where we really mess up. I think this is actually what trips us up a lot because when we think about this patient, we're like, oh, this patient has diabetes, or this patient has a history of cancer, or this patient has been recently, you know, is on methotrexate for their rheumatoid arthritis, what have you. It really lends us, that leads us down this path, which I think is, is um, a priori would make, would make sense, but it doesn't seem to play out in the literature. So we asked the question, well, are there other clues? Are there other things that we could, we could see clinically that would make a difference? Now, the kind of the, the challenge here is one thing that you guys should be asking for is, well, if I'm speaking to you about cellulitis, like how do I know when something cellulitis? And I would argue for you guys that although the current gold standard of cellulitis that's accepted might be a dermatology or ID doctor looking at it, I don't consider myself that great at diagnosing cellulitis. I find it really hard. What I am is I'm really good at diagnosing things that are not cellulitis, right? So I have a long list of other things that can cause problems, so I'm pretty good at those things. But I have a, myself, clinically, a lot of times where I equivocate and I don't know. And then like you guys, when I'm in that situation, I do the risk-benefit when you're un uncertain, what's the risk and benefit of treating and, and, and not treating. So our question was, can we translate, sort of some, are there some clinical clues or findings that we could do that could make us more systematic in that? The idea of like this, uh, if we needed somebody, if we need, this, is, this is not a disease that's gonna be taken care of by dermatologists and ID doctors, this is a disease for uh, primary care doctors, it's a disease for emergency room doctors, for uh, family practitioners. This is a first-line person disease. So what we did, we went back and looked at about 300 charts, and we went and, 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 and took out 50 characteristics, 40 to 50 characteristics for each patient of, of what we're looking for was objective findings. So things that weren't like, does it hurt, which is a subjective finding, or was it warm, right? So that's, that, that, that was, you know, what my warm is and what your warm is may be very different. But the idea of objective findings of what we could see either through testing or clinically seeing a patient that could help guide us. And what we originated was this score called the ALT-70 score. ALT stands for asymmetric, leukocytosis, tachycardia, and age greater than 70. Okay. This I just want to tell you guys just to make a note about life and how it changes. So we worked like two years on this. We were very excited. We published it. And then the... Um, like the week after we published it, that was one of the first time I ever heard of the alt-right, which came out. And I still hate the name of this thing, but this is what we got. But now you guys will remember it, because uh, that's, that's, that's what came out. We were thinking alternative diagnosis, what we were thinking. <laughs> so what we identified is basically that if you have cellulitis, so the idea is people say bilateral cellulitis does not exist. It does exist, it's just exceptionally, exceptionally uncommon. 
okay? And at times where I have seen bilateral psoriasis in one of two conditions, one where you either have somebody that is um, extremely, like a, a class would be like a homeless person or a, a malnourished, uh, like elder abuse type patient, somebody that's just very, very neglected, and they could have infections in multiple parts of their body if their skin is breaking down in multiple parts of their body. So that, that's a possibility. The second time I've seen this, the clinical scenario, is when you have a patient in whom um, uh, they have a hematogenous, uh, like a, 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 a infection, and you can, it's, it's rare to, to really get cellulitis in the skin from that, but high level staph or strep, you can get multiple areas of, uh, of, of cellulitis. So basically the patient needs to have asymmetry. Older patients, patients with white count above 10, 10 is in our, in our uh, system, like what the standard is, like the, the above 10 is abnormal, but I would argue that whatever your system uses would be fine. And tachycardia, we use the SERS criteria, so above, above 90. And we, we can add these points up, and you put them into these categories. So you put these either, if you have a lot of these points, you're very likely to have cellulitis. I'm going to show you that data in a moment. And it puts you into the treatment category. Um, if you don't have these, you should really be thinking about it. You should really be like, this is most likely not cellulitis, and we really need to reconsider this diagnosis. And if you're in this middle area, we added this area called consult. If I could go back and do this again, I think I would just draw a line. Um, uh, uh, I would do reassessment probably four and below and treat five and up. Uh, but think about this, this middle area. If you have access to consultation, I would probably put it into this reassessment. If you don't, you may, you may end up putting it in treatment category. But I feel this is the part that gives people a lot of confusion. So let's talk about the performance of this test. So with any test that you do, so this is our, so the more numbers you have in this, the more likely you are to have uh, cellulitis. For those of you who are trainees in the room, every single test, right, depending on what your cutoff point is, you change the sensitivity and specificity of the test. So there are some tests in which you want them to be highly, highly sensitive, those that you need them to be highly specific. In this case, you're trying to come up with, with something uh, very sensitive. So we could basically say that, um, it, it, it would give us a sense that, that we identified all cases with cellulitis. So, Basically, if I said that, if I said the, for lower extremity cellulitis, this, that uh, the, the, my, I have a test, here's my proposal for you for a test, and the test is, do you have legs, right? Then you have 100% sensitivity, right? Because everybody that has lower extremity cellulitis, by definition, will have a leg, right? But my specificity would probably be the, you know, 0.1% of the population that has that. And we're always talking about these trade-offs. So you can see that if you have all seven of these findings, seven points, you're very, very likely to have, almost certain to have, to have cellulitis. If you have fewer, your, your, your uh, sensitivity is higher, but your specificity is pretty low. So you have these couple of cutoffs here. These are, this is where, where, we, uh, uh, where um, we made recommendations on what to do. So basically, we said if the negative predictive value is above 80% that you, should, you don't have to treat. If the positive predictive value is over 80% that you should treat. And then in the middle, which is right in the 70s, that you should, um, uh, that you should ask for help. These are something that you could debate forever. It depends on your own personal risk profile. There's a large role, right? These are clinical guidelines and things that are meant to make you think. This should never mandate your treatment or, 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 or force you down a path that you don't want to. Uh, but you should think about your own pretest probability. You think about the risks and benefits to the patient, the clinical scenario. But you can use this to help guide you and hopefully to encourage you to think more broadly about times in which you can ask for help. So like any test, you need to validate it. So we went back and we validated this at a couple of institutions. And we also expanded this to look at its performance at 24 and 48 hours. So the ALT-70 is designed to be given at the time of, like in the emergency room, basically at the time they show up to the emergency room. We excluded cases where, you know, abscess or clear purulent type infections, et cetera. We also excluded cases of instrumentation. So I wouldn't use this to apply this to somebody that had like a knee replacement or something along those lines or people who had gotten significant um, IV antibiotics beforehand. But people, some people had been started by oral antibiotics by their primary care doctors. That was included. So our question was, okay, well, what if you didn't, not the person taking care of this patient in the emergency room, what about 24 or 48 hours later? And we identified that it, uh, it, it still works. So I think that if you think about these general principles of uh, asymmetry, leukocytosis, tachycardia, and age, and you apply them at 24 hours or 48 hours, you can see that the sensitivity and specificity, the predictive values are, are, are maintained. Um, and that, of course, the performance determines is it positive above three or above five? That, that's your own personal judgment as to how you do it. But you don't have to remember this. This is on MD Calc. Who here uses MD Calc? Great. All right. So this is our first dermatology tool uh, that we have on MD Calc. And uh, it's on there. You can put it on your, on your phone or use it on the computer. 
and again, meant to generate discussion, meant to encourage you to um, ask for assistance and gain help when, uh, when you need it. And you also don't have to remember any of the scores or things. You just click it in and it'll tell you what to do. There's also, we also have links on this to um, the papers that have the characteristics of the test on it. So again, remember, don't follow any test blindly. Make sure that you go and read about it. Think about the setting in which it was applied. So that's great. It's nice to have like this, this scoring system. But the other question is, well, we live in a, in a technological age. Can technology help us scale this? Are there other solutions that we can, we can do? So this, uh, our, our sister group at MGH, led by Dr. Krasinski, um, they asked the question, can skin surface temperatures measured by thermal imaging aid in the diagnosis of cellulitis? So we talked about heat, right? So the idea that you can touch something and say it's warm, right? Or you can look at the surrounding skin. But their question was, if I have, let's say, a cellulitis on one leg, can I compare the temperature of that leg to the other leg, and would this help me differentiate between cellulitis and then people that have pseudocellulitis. So again, red inflammatory conditions of, of the leg. So in their um, cohort, they have incredibly high, they use a cutoff of 0.5, uh, 0.47, really 0.5 half a degree Celsius. And they have, they say, perfect sensitivity. And then, you know, about 50% specificity with a good positive predictive value in the 86%. So anytime you see anything that's 100% sensitive, you should always question it a little bit. Um, and, and looked at that, but it was, it was promising. So let me show you how this works. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. This is a, a guy, like an electrician using this, which is really the, the, the technique for this. So these are basically, this is a, I'm not endorsing any particular product, but the consumer version of this device is, is made by a company called Slur. It connects to your phone, you can do Android or, or, or Apple device. And what it does is it takes in infrared um, uh, temperature settings, uh, or, or uh, uh, Sense, has an infrared sensor and it converts that into a heat reading. And what this is designed for is like if you have like a draft in your house or you know something like that, you can like go and look and see, oh, I need to put insulation here, or insulation there, something like that. So there are ways in which you can design these for medical use where there's you know several thousand dollars in, uh, and like very large devices that can tell you like within you know a 0.1 uh, uh, of a degree what the, what the temperature is. These are not that precise. They're not meant to be that, that exactly precise. But I think the decision was made that you know, the goal of this is not to create a new hardware that everybody has to buy, but to say, can we adapt a technology that people, most people already have on them uh, to do this? Um, so these cost uh, uh, in, in a couple hundred dollars, uh, about two to three hundred dollars, depending on the type that you're getting. So let me give you an example of how we use this clinically. So this is an African-American gentleman. Um, he has, this is a, a, a concern for an infection here. I think they put a needle into it, which is why it was bleeding, but it wasn't bleeding when he came. And you can see this leg's a little bit more swollen. It's maybe a little bit pinkish. It's hard to, to, to even, even this, this picture is not the best picture. Um, it's not projected that, that well. But it, it's hard um, in, in, in people of color sometimes to differentiate, and particularly in this part of the body, where he already has, from, from rubbing, a little bit of discoloration on the, on the side. So while there's maybe a little bit of a violet rim here, a violet hue, uh, it, it, it's different. It's not, it's not as strikingly uh, apparent clinically um, just looking at it. So this is how the, the device works. This is the, like the, the clinical photo, and this would be a, an example of what you get from a temperature standpoint. So this guy's thigh happens to be 98.2 degrees. Its skin temperature is actually some, often um, less than the, um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have to be the same temperature as your body. Um, but you have this uh, 98.2 degrees here. And then you look at this other side, and all, all of a sudden you can see, oh, this whole area is incredibly red. It's incredibly, it's incredibly hot, right? Uh, not red, but incredibly uh, warm. So this, this, this temperature difference of six or seven degrees uh, gives us a clue, right, that, that there's inflammation going on. Now, this is a very dramatic case. Like, if you touch this guy's leg, it would be strikingly hot, right? There are some things that change the sensitivity of this that you can imagine. So if you have a fever, if I have a, if I have a fever, um, my temperature goes up everywhere on my skin, right? It's not, it's not differential, though. It, it, um, uh, it, it, it will go up uniformly on my skin. Now, the difference is that um, if it goes up too much, sometimes the, you can't get any more inflamed than you already are inflamed. So sometimes I can mute the difference between the two sides. But I do have a lot of patients where you'll see you know, 100 here, and then, or 101 here, and then 104 on the other side. So it can still work in that setting as well. The other thing that was interesting that we didn't realize as much beforehand, but now makes sense, is that if you have a wound or you have a um, puncture in the skin, you know, the skin keeps your heat in, and there often you can, you'll have a cool area where temperature is where the heat is, is, is really leaving the body. So there are some there are some things to consider here. 
So it's a neat idea, it's a neat technology. So what we did is we went and did this perspective, we looked at imaging and we compared this to how does this look um, relative to our Alt-70 score for the lower extremities. Now there are advantages to imaging over Alt-70, right? The advantages are you really don't need to know anything about the patient, you just shine a, a light on them and, and uh, take a picture, which most people can do, that's one advantage. The second advantage is that the Alt-70 is really designed for lower extremities. There's a lot of other parts of your body where you can get cellulitis or concern for cellulitis, and this could help differentiate. But what we identified was this, um, that the Alt-70 outperformed uh, the thermal imaging um, uh, in these tests. Uh, and even though the, the, oh, there's some overlap in confidence intervals, um, at best you could say that they're equivalent. And if you have one that has the technology and one that doesn't, the one that's easier to use is probably better. We tried them in combination, saying that, okay, you could use both of them and see how that goes. Uh, it improved our positive predictive value um, but, but it, um, it dropped our sensitivity um, where, sorry, this is that they would both need, they need to align. Um, and it dropped our sensitivity because we needed uh, additional, um, you needed to pass both tests. It did dramatically improve our specificity though, so it's something, it's something to think about. So yeah, so in addition to the patients with fever, the other time in which um, this really doesn't work is in profoundly acute stasis. And acute stasis being, uh, which can often occurs bilaterally, right? But often um, we had uh, actually two cases in which um, people had a intra-abdominal mass or thrombosis which led to unilateral leg um, uh, stasis a very acute, in a very acute setting. So these are patients coming with a red, hot, swollen leg. They get a, DV, they get a, a Lenny, so the lower extremity ultrasounds of their, of their leg. There's no clot, right, because there's no clot in any of the traditional vessels because the clot is intra-abdominal. They were later found on one on CT to have lymphoma recurrence. Uh, the second one to have a, a, a large intra-abdominal clot that was um, ca causing problems. So another question, so as we're looking, we're just trying to answer this question a bunch of different ways. Well, this is my, reflecting my own bias, I'm an inpatient uh, uh, dermatologist. What if we saw these patients not at day, what if we didn't wait for people to call us? What if we just showed up, okay? And this is something that I think is, uh, it was a very interesting experience for me because it was, the idea of like a consultant, as somebody who, who, who's been a hospitalist, who's, who's, seen, who, who's done that, the idea of a consultant just showing up randomly on your patients and starting to give you advice is a really like uh, off-putting thing, right? And we think about collegiality and, 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 and camaraderie um, and also this sense that most people feel that they're really comfortable with this disease. I don't think when we say a third of these people make misdiagnoses, I don't think that people are either aware that they're doing that or doing that willingly. People think they, they know what they're doing and they're, they're comfortable with it, the choices they're making. So this required a lot of buy-in from the institution. And actually there's two simultaneous trials, one from published both in JAMA Dermatology on the same day. This is our trial at the Brigham, which was a, um, a not a randomized trial, it was a prospective trial looking at every patient that, that uh, came in where we, where we saw them um, prior to, to admission. And then this second one is a randomized control trial where people are either randomized to normal care or randomized to uh, early intervention by a dermatologist. And they, and they took, a, took a look at that. The results were, were um, very consistent actually across both trials, which is very nice because the, the, the methodologies and the locations are different. So the misdiagnosis rate, about the same. So the misdiagnosis rate, if you look across the entire literature, if you look at the average of the entire literature, anything ever published on this is 30%. So it's over and over and over is one out of three. So this is in different settings, in different countries, in the ED, in outpatient settings, whatever you do is across. So this is not reflective of I think specific institution is reflective of the fact that this is, this is challenging. Let me walk you through these, these, these results of our trial first. So we identified that we reduced unnecessary antibiotic use by about 75%. We reduced unnecessary hospitalizations by 85%. So we were able, we sent a whole bunch of people directly home from the emergency room, from ops and things like, from things along those lines, um, really treating them for the mimickers of cellulitis. So, so, and usually the most common thing was vascular, actually a lot of like inflammatory conditions. There's some really exceptional cases. I had a patient who I saw, who I met through this study, who amazingly had been treated, had had recurrent cellulitis for seven years, for seven years. And she had gotten to the point where she was getting IV antibiotics for prophylaxis on a monthly basis. Now you can, however you feel about that, you can think about it, but they were desperate, basically. And she's a, she's a, a young woman from, from Guatemala, and we identified, when we examined her, we're like, oh, this is really unusual. This doesn't, it's definitely inflamed, it's definitely hot, it's definitely um, uh, tender. Uh, but we uh, ended up identifying that she, as a, she was maybe now 30 years old, 32 years old. When she was 15, she had had, um, uh, one of her friends had injected her buttocks 
with uh, silicon uh, for augmentation. So the, the, what they wanted to do was they wanted to make their, her, her buttocks rounder um, for aesthetic purposes. And whether she was not willing to admit this or even forgotten about it, it was, or, uh, you know, it was, but it was done on a whim as a kid with like a, a silicon, that made, like, like, I don't know, either it was industrial or they had found it from somewhere. It wasn't like a, their medical grade silicon. What this had done was it had traveled over time from her buttocks down her leg. So you could actually do an MR and you could see like this trail of silicon that over the years had navigated and was really down around the, um, uh, the, the popliteal fossa, around her knee in that area. And she now over time had developed granulomatous reaction. So she was getting the foreign object, she was developing basically a foreign body response in the same way that you would if a splinter was in your hand for a long time or anything, right? Um, and this inflammatory reaction was being, uh, was being treated with antibiotics and elevation and things, things like that. So we put her on, on uh, some steroids, first orally, then, then topically. Then we ended up, um, we couldn't remove it because it was, it's not like a one spot. It's like the whole, the whole area is there. And then put her on some chronic anti-granulomatous therapy with, in her case, uh, minocycline. Um, and she went from having a monthly infusions and being hospitalized three to four times a year to the, her life is totally normal, you know. We've tapered her down. She takes, you know, 50 milligrams of, of minocycline every other day now. She's totally fine. She gets one flare a year. We give her some steroids and she has that. And it's really life altering for her. But I can't blame them. That's such a zebra diagnosis, such an unusual thing that I can't blame them for doing that. But you can imagine there are these patients out there. So for this, uh, these other patients, uh, and, the, and the other side of the trial, again, as I said, similar misdiagnosis rate, they showed lower antibiotic duration and superior clinical improvement at two weeks for patients that were seen by dermatology. So both of these suggest that an earlier role for dermatology may be a benefit. Now that's easy to say when you're at an institution like mine where you have dermatologists. We're actually dermatologists 24-7. You guys have access to dermatology here, but a lot of places in the community, it's not scalable, right? A human solution to this problem is not scalable. And when I think about this, I wonder where's our troponin? I think back to some of the earliest papers around in cardiovascular outcomes, and there's a debate, like this is an incredible debate. Like, did this person have a heart attack? Is this person having a heart attack? Like how do you identify what is a myocardial infarction? And uh, if you go back to the early literature on that, when it's still working out the pathophysiology, there's a lot of debate as to when can you identify this? How can you identify this? How do you classify people? Then over time, you develop, first develop CK, CK, MB, and then troponin, now more ultra-sensitive assays. And this is what we want, the gold standard you're looking at, right? And I told you, I'm not a very good gold standard, okay? I'm not, I, this is not, and I'm also really not scalable in the way we need to do it. So all we can talk about, you know, increasing consultation, improving, let's say, things like teledermatology, which we have some data suggesting will, can work well in these settings. We need it, we need a test. So ideally what we're looking for is a highly sensitive and specific objective test for differentiating cellulitis from its mimicker. So some of you could say, okay, well, what about our good friend procalcitonin? So procalcitonin, we often use, um, do you guys use procalcitonin in mock here? Do you guys use it to differentiate? Yeah. I feel procalcitonin is like, um, there's like certain things in your life where you get them. It's like, uh, so if they're high, you can accept it, and if they're low, you can also reject it. I feel it's like, um, getting a uric acid level on somebody that has active gout, and if it's high, you're like, oh, I knew it. And if it's low, you're like, oh, it's because it's precipitated out, and I'm, you know, it's not that reliable. Or the, our, our classic is the um, ACE uh, in, in patients with sarcoid, where you can just, you just decide how you want to interpret it. So the AUC, so looking at AUC, basically the area under the curve, it's a general sense of what, like, does a test work well, right? So it kind of gives you a sense of, at different cutoff points, what, what, how does it work? So an AUC that's good is above 0.7 or 0.8 would be a very good test. So the AUC here is 0.63, so it's poorly predictive of limb cellulitis. This is a study that was done out of the UK. What they did was they had a randomized clinical trial looking at um, two different antibiotics, I think clindamycin versus maybe Bactrim for, for treatment of cellulitis. And this is a sub-analysis of their group to identify could they have some predictive values. So the CRP, which we would all agree is really hard to interpret in these settings, is about as good as the procalcitonin. And in contrast, our ALT-70 is 0.85, the thermal imaging is 0.76, so you can see that these much cheaper tests um, and, and, uh, are, are greatly outperformed this. It was interesting, they identify, so I think often this 0.25 uh, micrograms per liter as a threshold for antibiotics when you're looking at it in other, to rule out other infections. So most of the patients were below this threshold. They said that levels do decrease over time, so you can kind of use this to track a little bit, although you can say, well, you can look at it also. 
So you cannot predict early, early improvement or need for, for antibiotics. So this, this, is not, this is not the, the, the way to go. Reminds me my, my, of, of one other thing I want to talk about, and one other thing that I think is really interesting and we don't have data for. Um, I've been thinking a lot about so this, this last part. How do you know when somebody's improving? How do you know if somebody's getting better? Sometimes we see patients and their leg is still red or it's still tender, and people ask us, is this normal, or should they be better by now? And as I think more and more about this, I, although it wasn't taught to me in this way, and maybe taught to you guys now, but it's probably not, I'm wondering, this is a speculation, I don't have data for this, if in the same way that we don't look for um, clinical, we, we don't measure whether a, a pneumonia is better by looking at a chest x-ray, because the chest x-ray can dramatically lag, as I think about the amount of inflammation and the amount of local vasodilation, things like that that occur, I wonder if there, we need, I wonder if the erythema or the clinical pictures that we look at are, are a lagging indicator of improvement. And whether a test like this or something better like this would allow us to say, even though your leg doesn't look perfect, or even though in the same way that your chest actually doesn't look perfect, maybe we, we can already tell you're getting better, you're already improving. So we looked a little bit at temperature differential, temperature lag, it doesn't change that much dramatically over time, but it's an area of active investigation. So one area that we're looking at, an experimental approach, is we ask ourselves the question, is there some, are there other ways in which we can look at this? Are there other um, ways in which we can evaluate in an objective way what's happening when you have cellulitis? So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna walk you through this in a moment. But the basis behind this research is that there's been a lot of data to suggest that, so we know that you have neutrophilia in, in infectious states, okay? Particularly often, either neutrophilia, neutropenia, and sepsis, but a lot of those patients have elevated white counts. Uh, what we've identified over time is actually the function, even though you have more white count, uh, more white blood cells, these neutrophils don't work as well as, as they do in somebody that is um, not sick. So ironically, at a time in which you are sick and you need these guys to work as best as they can, the state of being sick, that state of inflammation, makes it so that um, you, your, your white blood cells don't work as well as they would in other settings. So one of the ways they measured this um, was through this, a microfluidics experiment. So this is, a, this is at um, data from the uh, IRIMA lab, which is at MDH. And what these guys do is they take, this is um, 100, 100 uh, micrometers is this, is this white line here. Okay, so these are, these are tiny, tiny, it's under, it's under a, um, a microscope that they're looking at it. And in this well, in the middle, in this well, they have, you can see maybe these little green dots. Okay, you'll see more of them in a moment. But these are fluorescently labeled um, stats. And all these blood cells, all these out here are white blood cells. Okay, these are a bunch of white blood cells. And the only way they can get through this is to go through this narrow little channel. This is like, um, they're going to try to attack the Death Star. That's like the way I look at it. You have to get out of this little, very little, narrow, narrow network. And then they come in here, and this is where the fighting occurs. They fight the bacteria. Okay? So let me show you, this is somebody that's healthy. So let me show you what happens. I'll play it for you a couple times, okay, so you can see it. All right, and then the true modern miracle, we're gonna get a video, an embedded video to work in PowerPoint today, and that's the take home. If you remember anything with this talk, is that we were able to do this. All right, so check this out. These are the green, these are the green that look, the cells are coming in, they're homing in, they're homing in, and they are clearing it out, they're winning, they are consuming the, the, the green orbs, which are all at the end embedded, okay? So they're, they haven't multiplied, the white cells have won, and uh, the ones, the green dots you see are, are like, are engulfed. I'll play that for you one more time. All right, so you can see this, this incredible war going on inside this little chamber. All right. Now, in contrast, check out this on the, on the other side. So there are a ton of white blood cells here. This person has a lot of white blood cells. And they have this, the, the amount of bacteria in here is exactly the same. Okay, so these are this is a controlled experiment. So the same thing happens. White blood cells start coming in, they start coming in, they start fighting, there's more of them. But look, look at the bacteria, it's multiplying, it's multiplying, they're not winning. Oh no. It went straight full uh, deviled egg on us. And uh, I'll stop for that for you one more time as well, just to take a look. But this shows you, so this is a time in which the, so basically they're looking at both, does it clear or not as a very binary outcome? But the other thing is they can measure how well your neutrophils work 
by um, how long it takes for it to clear, right? So this is a measure of, of neutrophil assay. So although we know this works in severe infection, I think that what we're currently exploring is whether or not this works in cellulitis. So we're currently working, collaborating with this lab, doing this similar experience in patients with cellulitis. Although I'm really eager and excited about this work, my sense is that it would be very similar to procalcitonin, where the level of inflammation is probably low and different uh, enough such that we won't be able to tell a difference. Um, don't tell any of my grant people that, but I think that's my, uh, that, that's, that's my theory. That's my theory for that. But I think it's important for us to look because we have to begin to identify these. So I'm hoping that someday in the future, when some patient comes in with cellulitis, you basically are talking about them, not just that they have cellulitis, but they have their, their, either their predictive score or their temperature, the way that we talked about it, but hopefully eventually being their, you know, their blood value showed X or their blood value showed Y, right? No blood test is perfect, but something that would give us additional insight would be of benefit. So for now, though, I think that we, we're left with teamwork. So this is our, our guidelines for our emergency department uh, intake. Um, so if you suspect, you know, uh, soft tissue infection. So this purulent, you know, you have a clear path. It's hard, there are very few mimickers of purulent cellulitis. There are some, but there, there are few. But this non-purulent is really where I think the confusion comes in. And you can see what we've done in collaboration is we brought in dermatology for mild and moderate patients. And this is something that saves the institution tremendous amounts of money because they're admitting people that stay a long time so they don't get better, right, with the treatments that we have. It makes these patients better, faster. It plugs them into resources that they need. If you need to see a dermatologist as an outpatient, that's a lot better and easier and cheaper for you than being admitted for six or seven days. And I think for me, what I really like most about it is that it shows a commitment on all sides, not that like somebody is coming in and forcing their opinion on you, but really a collaboration, teamwork, an idea that this problem is difficult and we need to use these temporizing measures to try to uh, get the answers that we, uh, that we can uh, until we hopefully have better solutions. So in conclusion, cellulitis is a common condition but tough to diagnose. Think, think about, question your diagnosis. I think that have some, be tempered in your resolve, particularly if the patient is not going the way that you want, ask for help, okay? Just ask around, have other people do, think about things, expand your differential. Because most of the time when I remember being a health staff, I was a resident guy for five years, two residencies, and I did a chief year after that, a long time to be a resident. I was happy to get a satellite patient. They come in, you, you, it's easy, you put them on antibiotics, you see them a day later, you're not really thinking about them that actively. Spend a couple minutes thinking about them extra. Additional research and efforts are required to identify gold standard assays for, uh, assays for diagnosis, but until then, uh, humility and teamwork I think is the key. Be humble in ourselves, and in terms of our, our, our sense of our own diagnosis and encourage teamwork to try to improve the care of these patients. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for a terrific lecture. You actually did all of them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, Cellulitis affects everybody. I mean, we are often seeing it, often the people that are confusing, or we have a large number of cardiac patients. I think the differentiating between stasis and cellulitis is challenging, particularly in people that have skin breakdown. So they have other, they, they're at risk for cellulitis. And then the second population is patients that have um, either active or history of malignancy. Where I think for those folks, we really only think that the, the thing that they could have is, um, we're, 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 we're so prone to think of them as, being, as having infection that, uh, uh, we don't really expand the differential otherwise. And some of my most rewarding cases I've had are, again, not the incredible diagnosis, but telling somebody that, uh, uh, you know, a breast cancer patient with a uh, redness on her arm that it's, that it's edema or stasis or contact dermatitis. So instead of being in a hospital, she can go to, you know, her son's graduation or things along those lines. There's a lot of human burden, right, to this that, that because of our misdiagnosis. And uh, it's, um, it's been exciting to see how this uh, collaborative efforts have been able to improve it. So this is the classic. This is the classic question. So I told for those students in the room, I always say when they ask what question should you ask this patient, always if you don't know anything to ask, I always say, do they have it before? It's like you'll, you'll be right every time. Um, I think in general, for two reasons, it probably shows the susceptibility, and then secondly, I feel that people that do actually have recurrent cellulitis get structural changes, which uh, fibrosis, reduced length, et cetera, that leads to that. Now the struggle with that is that 
a lot of people that have misdiagnosis have you know, recurrent edema, recurrent vasculitis, recurrent whatever that's misdiagnosed as well. So while I do believe that in two cellulitis what you're saying is correct, um, it hasn't, in my opinion, been a very good, I, I, I consider somebody with recurrent cellulitis more at risk for having another diagnosis than necessarily, than, than having, than, than necessarily having cellulitis multiple times. So most of the time, um, it was mostly vascular. We had a subset. We looked at the diagnoses that there was, but a lot of them were just weird, weird things and, and, uh, and things that you couldn't necessarily predict. I think a lot of people get confused when there's a lot of swelling, I think, and a lot of tightness. Patients would describe it as painful. And I think that's really what messes people up. And I think if you think about most stasis, most stasis is acute anyway, right? So say for three days, my leg really hurts, it's warm, et cetera. The biggest differentiator I found for those patients is that in my mind, if you have a cellulitis that covers like your whole leg or half your leg, and you're just hanging out, right? This is like the patient for me as a consultant. I go to try to see them, and they're like going out for a smoke or going to the cafeteria, and I can't find them because they're like, they're not sick. They're, 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 just, they're just hanging out. I think that for me is a good sign that there might be something else. But the hard part was that I don't think there was very many like specific physical clues. And I think that's why we've been trying to look for more objective things that are, that are separate. As I challenge a lot of dermatology, that things that you, you have to see a lot of it, I think, to, to think about it, you have to see a lot of it with direct feedback that, that, oh, this is not why this is, or this is what it is. And I think for a lot of people, if you have, um, I think about this very similar to onychomycosis. For onychomycosis, or nail dystrophy for dermatology, there's like 30 things that can cause it. For my medicine colleagues, it's, you know, they think about a fungus, and maybe they think about trauma, and maybe they think about psoriasis. That's just about it. So, you know, you have it for you synonymous with, with one condition. Um, and then the other, the other so, so it wasn't very much education on that part. It was education about identification and getting a consult, um, and, and also um, uh, education around the idea that a lot of people were just saying, if I don't know, I'm going to default to antibiotics, and, and education around the potential negative outcomes of that. Um, because a lot of these people are just ED patients, and they're not, like, the ED doesn't take care of them for next week. They take care of them for four hours, and they just send them to that, and, you know, in-house, and then they're, they're kind of languishing. Uh, among, sorry, among the patients who are